We've been told for decades that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance and low serotonin levels. And that message clearly got through because according to a recent survey, 85 to 90% of the public believes it. The chemical imbalance theory of depression has led to an explosion in prescriptions for antidepressant medications. About one in nine Americans and one in six people in the UK take them. And a report from the National Center for Health Statistics found that antidepressant use increased by almost 400% in the US between 1998 and 2008. But what if the idea that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance and low serotonin levels is wrong? That's exactly what a new study just published by researchers in the UK suggests. They present convincing evidence that the chemical imbalance theory of depression is a myth and is not supported by the scientific evidence. In this week's Tuesday Tip, I'll review this study and discuss its implications and share some alternative theories on what really does cause depression in most people. Ready? Let's get to it. Hey everyone, I'm Chris Kresser with another Tuesday Tip video for you. The idea that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance is so deeply ingrained in our psyche that few of us even question it anymore. It's formed the basis for the dramatic rise in antidepressant use with hundreds of millions of people around the world taking these drugs for years and even decades. For example, a previous Pfizer TV ad for Zoloft stated that, quote, depression is a serious medical condition that may be due to a chemical imbalance, end quote. And that, quote, Zoloft works to correct this imbalance, end quote. Yet, as well accepted as this theory is today, it's been criticized by a small but vocal group of physicians and scientists for many years. In fact, I wrote an article on my website almost 15 years ago called The Chemical Imbalance Myth, which summarized the problems with the theory and the lack of evidence to support it. I opened that article with a quote from one of the critics of the chemical imbalance theory, Dr. Elliot Ballenstein. He said, quote, a theory that is wrong is considered preferable to admitting our ignorance. This is a perfect summary of how the idea that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance came to be almost sacrosanct in our society. There was never strong evidence to support it, but we didn't have a good alternative theory, so the chemical imbalance myth just continued to spread, fueled in large part by pharmaceutical companies that were making billions of dollars on the sale of antidepressant drugs. Before I go on, I want to acknowledge that some of what I'm going to talk about may be difficult to take in for people with depression who are on SSRIs or other antidepressant medications. If you've been told that depression is a chemical imbalance and that SSRIs fix that chemical imbalance, learning that there's no evidence to support this idea could feel like the rug has been pulled out from under you. I know from my work with patients that some people do benefit tremendously from SSRIs. In fact, they can be literally life-saving in some circumstances. But it's worth pointing out that there are other possible explanations for why these drugs work other than by correcting serotonin levels or another chemical imbalance. Let's take a closer look at what this new study found. It was published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry and the lead author was Dr. Joanna Moncrieff, a professor of psychiatry at University College in London and a consultant psychiatrist at Northeast London NHS Foundation Trust. Dr. Moncrieff has been an outspoken critic of the chemical imbalance theory for many years. In fact, her book, The Myth of the Chemical Cure, was what really opened my eyes to the problems with this way of looking at depression. This new paper was a type of study called an umbrella review, which is itself an overview of existing meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Dr. Moncrieff and her colleagues looked at 17 studies in their analysis, collectively including tens of thousands of participants. That makes this by far the most comprehensive and authoritative review on the chemical imbalance theory that has ever been published. In an interview with Science Daily, Dr. Moncrieff summarized the findings like this, quote, it is always difficult to prove a negative, but I think we can safely say that after a vast amount of research conducted over several decades, there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by serotonin abnormalities, particularly by lower levels or reduced activity of serotonin. The popularity of the chemical imbalance theory of depression has coincided with the huge increase in the use of antidepressants. Prescriptions for antidepressants have risen dramatically since the 1990s, 
with one in six adults in England and 2% of teenagers now being prescribed an antidepressant in a given year. Many people take antidepressants because they've been led to believe their depression has a biochemical cause, but this new research suggests this belief is not grounded in evidence." End quote. How did Dr. Moncrieff and our colleagues arrive at this conclusion? Well, there are several lines of evidence. First, studies have shown that there is no difference in serotonin levels, either in the blood or in brain fluids, between people with depression and healthy controls. Second, Studies where serotonin levels were artificially lowered using dietary restriction of amino acids that produce serotonin found that lowering serotonin in this way did not produce depression in hundreds of healthy volunteers. And third, large studies with tens of thousands of participants found no difference in genes for serotonin transporters between people with depression and healthy controls. These findings, along with others that you can read about in the full text of the paper if you'd like, which is available for free, led the authors to conclude that there is, quote, no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lowered serotonin activity or concentrations, end quote. The researchers also pointed out another disturbing finding. Evidence from a large meta-analysis revealed that people who used antidepressants had lower levels of serotonin in their blood. And they speculated that antidepressants may produce a short-term increase in serotonin that's followed by compensatory changes in the brain that actually reduce serotonin levels over the long term. So there's a real risk in perpetuating the chemical imbalance myth, as Dr. Moncrieff explained in her Science Daily interview. Quote, our view is that patients should not be told that depression is caused by low serotonin or by chemical imbalance, and they should not be led to believe that antidepressants work by targeting these unproven abnormalities. We do not understand what antidepressants are doing to the brain exactly, and giving people this sort of misinformation prevents them from making an informed decision about whether to take an antidepressant or not. Thousands of people suffer from side effects of antidepressants, including the severe withdrawal effects that can occur when people try to stop them. Yet prescription rates continue to rise. We believe this situation has been driven partly by the false belief that depression is due to a chemical imbalance. It is high time to inform the public that this belief is not grounded in science. So if depression isn't caused by a chemical imbalance, what is the cause? I think we need to move away from oversimplified explanations of depression and start thinking about it as a complex condition with multiple possible causes. As a functional medicine clinician, I've always looked at depression from a systems perspective. I consider factors like nutrient deficiency, gut health, inflammation, environmental toxins, hormone imbalance, trauma, and stressful life events, all of which have been shown in multiple studies to contribute to depression. Depression is not merely a simple chemical equation, as we've been led to believe. It's a complex interplay of numerous factors, both psychological and physiological. But one theory that's gained traction over the past 20 years is called the inflammatory cytokine model of depression. I wrote about it back in 2014, and I'll include a link to the article in the description section. My Tuesday tip video next week will be on this topic, so make sure to subscribe so that you're notified when I release it. But here's the gist. A large body of research now suggests that inflammation is a major cause of depression. In an excellent review paper by Burke and colleagues, the authors presented several lines of evidence supporting this connection. Depression is often present in acute inflammatory illnesses. Higher levels of inflammation increase the risk of developing depression. Administering endotoxins that provoke inflammation to healthy people triggers classic depressive symptoms. One quarter of patients who take interferon, a medication used to treat hepatitis C that causes significant inflammation, develop major depression. And remission of clinical depression is often associated with a normalization of inflammatory markers. There's a lot of evidence to support this theory, with some studies suggesting that inflammation may account for more than half of all depression diagnoses. But if depression is primarily caused by inflammation, the obvious question that arises is, what is causing the inflammation? Well, in the article I just mentioned, I covered nine typical causes of inflammation that could lead to depression, and I'll discuss these in more detail in next week's Tuesday Tip. I want to finish up by, again, acknowledging that this could be a lot to take in if you struggle with depression. We've all been told for so many years that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance 
and that SSRIs work by correcting that imbalance. Learning that this is not likely could be destabilizing. But here's the good news. Knowledge is power. When we have a better understanding of what really causes depression, we have a much better shot at treating it effectively. And this research doesn't mean that SSRIs don't ever work. Clearly they do for some people. But as Dr. Moncrieff said, the evidence suggests that there must be another mechanism that explains their benefit when they are effective. And hopefully this new study will spur additional research to discover exactly what that mechanism is. Okay, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to click the subscribe button in the lower right and tap the notification bell so you'll be updated when I release new content. If you know someone that might benefit from this, please share it with them by clicking the share button right under the video. And finally, just a reminder to check out the description section for links to the articles and studies I mentioned in the video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.